Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Jane Kamensky. I'm the director of the Schlesinger Library here at Radcliffe Institute and a professor in Harvard's history department. And I'm thrilled to welcome you on behalf of all my colleagues at Harvard Radcliffe Institute and its Schlesinger Library on the history of women to this momentous historical discussion meant to coincide with the Supreme Court's 7 to 2 January 1973 decision in Roe versus Wade. An awful lot of planning went into these days of convening together. I reached out to Professor Mary Ziegler, who you will know as the preeminent scholar on the history of Roe and its aftermath, in July of 2020. And we had our first conversation about what these events could become soon after. Diverse groups of scholars joined us in planning calls after that. Our amazing moderator tonight, Professor Michelle Bratcher Goodwin, has been part of this talking shop since September of 2020, as have many of the speakers you'll hear in tomorrow's sessions. I invoke this long, patient, difficult, and mind-expanding work at the outset for a reason. Building on the Schlesinger's peerless collections about pregnancy, birth control, and all sides of the battle over abortion, we are seeking to have an honest, cross-ideological, multidisciplinary conversation about an issue that is literally existential, one of the most intimate in the lives of women and families, and one of the most urgent in American public discourse. This braiding of intimate and public life has been, since the 1960s, a central feature of pro-choice, reproductive, and pro-life organizing alike. These have long been movements in which the personal is political, to quote the feminist idiom of the late 1960s. These have long been movements in which direct acts of witness, testimonials, stories, have done work in the worlds of law and politics and policy. And so we begin our time together with four expert practitioners of the storyteller's art and science, expertise that undergirds their impressive credentials in the academy, the clinic, and the nonprofit. Professor Goodwin and all of our panelists tonight Think about the past, present, and future of abortion and of women's health in America by centering the experience of black women. That means that they think about disparities in healthcare and reproductive outcomes that are as staggering as they are unacceptable. And I'm thinking of a New York Times article just earlier this week documenting a needless maternal death in Brooklyn and pointing out that a black woman's maternal mortality in that city is nine times that of white women in New York City and state, New York. The work of stories as practiced by Getty Israel, by Katherine Davis, and by Renee Bracey Sherman combines narrative art and a profound call to action. It's now my honor to introduce Professor Michelle Goodwin, who will offer some further framing and introduce our speakers. Goodwin is Chancellor's Professor of Law at the University of California, Irvine, and this semester also serves as the Abraham Panansky Visiting Professor of Law here at Harvard. Goodwin is a scholar who moves minds and mountains. Thank you, Michelle, for all your work with us these past nearly three years and for leading us tonight. It is now my great pleasure to invite Michelle Bratcher Goodwin to the podium. Thank you all so much. And that was incredibly generous. Thank you so, so very much, Jane. So I am going to start off with opening comments and then invite my colleagues to join me uh, here. Just a week ago was the 50th year anniversary of the Supreme Court's decision in Roe v. Wade. 
and we could ask ourselves, what is the requiem for Roe? We could also ask ourselves, how do we understand it when property has no privacy? And let me explain what I mean by that. As you've just heard, Roe v. Wade was a seven to two opinion. Five of those seven justices were Republican appointed. Justice Blackmun, who wrote the opinion in Roe v. Wade, was placed on the court by Richard Nixon. No one would deign say that he was just a liberal at all. But one of the things that's lost in history is that Roe v. Wade comes 100 years after Bradwell v. Illinois. For those of you who may not be familiar with Bradwell v. Illinois, it is the case in which a woman wants to become a lawyer. She is not asking the court about her marital relationship. She's not asking about having children. She's not asking about whether it is her role and responsibility to take care of children. So it is worth noting in Bradwell v. Illinois when a woman seeks the Supreme Court to strike down an Illinois law that bars women from becoming attorneys, that the court answers in saying that her role is to take care of children and to take care of her husband. That was not what she was petitioning. <laughs> that's not the question she asked. But that's the response that she got. 100 years later, in Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court answers the question about the criminalization of abortion in a different kind of way. You see, it does matter who sits in the seats. It does matter what kinds of questions we are asking. It matters how we fill in those voids in our history. And so this evening, we are going to be engaged with storytelling, and you will hear individuals telling their stories. And here, what I want to spend a moment doing is to fill in a little bit more of the history. So although unstated in Roe, the court initiated the Roe of dismantling what had become a very ugly re record of complicity in affirming harmful laws that tethered women to motherhood, regardless of what it was that women were seeking. Some of the individuals that the court turns to today were individuals whose words held significant power and sway for our courts, like Sir Matthew Hale and Sir William Blackstone. These gentlemen uh, were ones who wrote treatises that our courts relied upon, and even the court in the Dobbs decision. By what they wrote, it was very clear that women were never meant to be enriched by the laws in our Constitution that provided for equality. In fact, according to Blackstone, quote, by marriage, the husband and wife are one person in law. That is the very being or legal existence of the woman. She is suspended, her existence is suspended during the marriage, or at least is incorporated and consolidated into that of the husband. Now, supposedly, a woman gained protection from being, quote, under her husband's wing, protection and cover. Blackstone declared that wives were to, quote, perform everything and is therefore called in our law a femme covert. Now, what history also can fill in for us was that it was Blackstone and Hale that also wrote about how marital rape was a non-existent thing because women were incorporated into their husband's existence and a man cannot rape himself. This kind of theorizing was relied upon by American courts when it also came to domestic violence. How can you be violent against yourself? Just close the door and all will be forgiven and forgotten was the thinking of American courts. In cases like Roller v. Roller or Abbott v. Abbott, in fact, let me just spend one quick moment on Abbott v. Abbott, where the Supreme Court of Maine denied relief for a married woman whose injuries were so severe that they required hospitalization. According to the court, 
The husband and the wife are one person, and as such, Mrs. Abbott was denied recovery. Now this sophistry extended to daughters as well. In Roller v. Roller, the Washington Supreme Court held that it would undermine public policy if a victimized teenage girl could recover after being serially raped by her father. Evidence of the sexual molestations were not at issue in the case as sufficient proof was provided at the lower court adjudication. Rather, as the justices explained, preserving domestic harmony took priority and manifested from, quote, the earliest organization of civilized government and inspired by the universally recognized fact that the maintenance of harmonious and proper family relations is conducive to good citizenship and therefore the welfare of the state. Let's let that sink in a little bit. But if we think about who gets to tell their stories and what stories actually count, then we might spend a moment thinking about the following. What story does an enslaved mother tell her child the night before the slave auction? She'll never see that child again. That child will no longer be tethered to her. And in a society that deems her to be property, a society that deems the child to have no worth higher than that of a mule in the field, a cow, a donkey, how does she convince that child that they have value, that they are somebody, that they are worth something? Despite what state law says, despite what federal laws say, you have value, importance, and meaning. And that it has to stick in such a way to endure for generations to come. It has to stick in such a way that the child will remember the essence, perhaps not her face, but the essence the night before the slave auction. Now the stories we tell are very important and it's important who gets a seat at the table to be able to tell the story and who gets to listen to it. So before I ask my panelists, the panelists up, I want us to think about a couple of stories. I want us to think about Harriet Jacobs. In 1861, she penned the book, her memoir, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. Now, I won't go on too long about this. Many of you have probably read it, but you know the story of Harriet Jacobs is one in which she was bequeathed to a five-year-old along with a piece of furniture. But the five-year-old had a very uh, predacious father, and she writes about how at the age of 10 and 11 years old, trying to escape the sexual grasps of the five-year-old's father, who refuses to sell her to her grandmother, who want, wants to purchase her freedom. The father would often say, well, I don't really own her. It's my daughter that does. Or to think about the story of Margaret Garner. Now, some of you will remember the name, and for those of you who don't, you'll remember Toni Morrison's beloved. But Margaret Garner was a real person. And what is Margaret Garner's story? Margaret Garner fleeing Kentucky, trying to get to Cincinnati, trying to get to the Ohio River. Right about now, January 27th, she's trying to get to Ohio. And why is she trying to get to Ohio? And what is the condition in which she's trying to get to Ohio in 1856? She has no Uggs, <laughs> no down winter coat, no shearling. But there's something that is so oppressive and undignified about slavery itself that this woman who is 22 years old with her children and companion says, tonight is enough. This is the last of it. And I will get to Ohio. And I will walk across that frozen river with these children and these companions and we will get there to freedom, not necessarily a place that welcomes us, but is a place that does not tolerate slavery. 
Well, as you know that story, when the hound dogs are after her and the bounty hunters can be heard, she begins grabbing her children, slits the throat of one that dies and begins to do the same for another. Witnesses say that she fought very, very hard when she was captured. And if we go further to Margaret Garner's story, we know that the questions being asked were whether she was property or a human being. And these are really important questions. And this was not just a local story. It's a story that was read about around the world. It was presented in the New York Times. Was her child property or a human being? And this mattered. Imagine, if she's a human being, then this does mean she can be charged with murder. And guess what? That's exactly what her lawyers want because her lawyers think it will be better. Imagine this. Better that you be charged with murder than to go back to Kentucky a slave. What does that say about that system? Well, she was property and so was her child. She was sent back to Kentucky and died before she was 25. Or we can think about the story of Celia, a slave, purchased at 14 years old by a man in his 70s who sexually abuses her in horrific ways, no great ways to abuse a person. And this lasts and lingers a long time until Celia says she has enough. She has enough, and she decides she's gonna kill him, and she did. And she topped up his body, and she put it in a furnace, and people went looking for him. <laughs> they couldn't find him, and they realized the last place he had gone was her cabin, and they sifted through the ashes and found some bone fragment. Celia's lawyer was confronted with this question similarly. What is Celia? Is Celia property or is she a woman? Now, Celia is not married. And unmarried women who are raped get to plead self-defense when they fight back. But she would have to be a human being. She'd have to be a woman and not simply property. Well, you know the story. Even if you don't know the story, you know that she was not a woman. She was not deemed a woman. She was pregnant and she met the noose and was hanged the day after she gave birth. The question for us is whether, in part, others knew these stories too. And over, well, tonight, tomorrow, as we think about these questions, we are asked by the court and Dobbs to think about what it was, what were the stories that were accessible to the individuals that framed the Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. These were stories that were widely talked about and written about. And I'm gonna close on this. So much so that Senator Charles Sumner from Massachusetts was beaten nearly to death in the halls of Congress only days after having given a speech about the rapes and sexual abuse that black girls and black women experienced as part of American slavery. It was a type of involuntary servitude that they wrote about, that they talked about, and that they pursued justice about, which delivers us the 13th Amendment. Now that's not necessarily, those are not necessarily the stories that you're gonna to hear tonight from my colleagues who are gonna join me up here. Renee Bracey Sherman, who's the founder and executive director of We Testify. Catherine Davis, who's the founder and president of the Restoration Project. Or Getty Israel, the founder and CEO of Sisters in Birth, Inc. But they will set the stage in terms of expressing the importance of narrative, the value of it, the ability to connect us to the people whose lives we think about and who judges adjudicate about, and I'll welcome them to the stage now. Thank you all so much.
one of our participants who's going to be online. And the first up will be Renee Bracy Sherman. And I think, Renee, that you're going to present from the podium. Okay. All right. Can I adjust the slides from here? If not, I'll just, oh, there it is. Thank you. You are welcome. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Hi. Um, my name is Renee Bracy Sherman. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the founder and executive director of We Testify, which is an organization dedicated to the leadership and representation of people who have abortions. Um, first, I want to say thank you to Professor Goodwin and to everyone at Harvard Radcliffe for inviting me. Um, and a special shout out to all of the organizers with the Harvard Student Unions and all of the organizers who are working, pushing to make this campus a safe space for all, particularly survivors of sexual assault. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, next slide. So that's me. And I had an abortion. Like many of you, I chose to have an abortion when I was 19 years old. I didn't tell anyone for six whole years, even though I was afraid that people would judge me. I knew it was the right decision for me, but I felt really guilty for not feeling guilty because society told us that we should feel bad for the decisions that we make for our futures and for our bodies. It was really, really stressful, the weight that I felt, because I knew that I had made the right decision for me to be able to get out of the relationship that I was in at the time, to be able to move forward with my life and my future and my education. I knew that it was the right decision. And yet, because of the abortion stigma that exists in this country and all around the world, I was told that I shouldn't talk about it, that I should be ashamed about it. And I believed it for so long. I was working in the LGBT movement for many years um, with young people who were sharing their stories as trans folks and um, queer folks with legislators talking about their experiences in school and the bullying and violence that happens because of our laws that teach that they shouldn't be represented in books and in history. I know it sounds familiar, but this was like 15 years ago. <laughs> We're still doing it, right? We haven't actually moved forward. And I was so impressed by the power of their voices and their words. And I knew that even as a cisgender heterosexual woman, that my liberation was tied up in theirs because I knew that the people who are oppressing me and my ability to have an abortion and my ability to decide if, when, and how to grow my family were also doing the same to people who wanted to be able to express their gender identity in the way that feels best for them, for those who wanted to love whomever they loved. I knew that our liberations were tied up together. And so I found joy and power in their stories. And I found a home. So I decided, okay, let me start working in repro a little bit. And I met other people who had abortions. And that, that power that lifted when you meet someone else and they say, I had an abortion too. It's like no one else is in the room with you because it's a connection. We know what the other has been through, even if it's a different experience from our own. I thought when I had my abortion that it was truly like me and Lil' Kim who were the only black girls holding it down for abortion. But that was not true because black and brown folks are largely left out of the conversation when it comes to the whole conversation on abortion, all of the opinions. Even the reproductive rights movement left a lot of our stories in the shadows out of the conversation. So I was surprised to find out that people have been having abortions for thousands of years. Thousands, 2000 years BCE. 
These are some herbs from when I was in uh, Cartagena. I went to a Palenque, um, which is a free black community where enslaved folks left, were able to escape from slavery and make their own community. And they still live there in Colombia. They are deeply ignored by the government. And I spoke with the medicine man there and he told me, showed me these are the herbs they use so folks can have abortions. Our history is still our present. People are still having abortions in a variety of ways. This is not just some old history or this is not a newfangled idea that started with Roe. This is our birthright and something that has been around for thousands of years that our ancestors have used to create the world that we're living in today. I want to be clear with some basic facts about abortion because I know the conversation can often be lacking in basic facts. Abortion has always been part of our communities. One in four of us, like I said, many of you, will have an abortion. The majority of people who have abortions are already parenting. The majority of people who have abortions are people of color. 95% of people who have abortions do not regret their decision three years later. Five years later, 99% do not regret their decision. The idea of things like abortion regret were made up by people like Justice Kennedy in the Supreme Court decision Gonzalez v. Carhartt and those who would oppose abortion to silence the voices of those of us who have abortions. That is why our voices are so important. And the most common relief after, sorry, the most common feeling after an abortion is relief. If you listen to our stories, you will know that. Everyone loves someone who's had an abortion. The conversation about abortion has been so polarized and so focused on politics and Democrats versus Republicans and not actually centered in the needs of people who actually need abortions and what kind of support we need when faced with a pregnancy, no matter the outcome of that pregnancy. We should be met with love and support, not shame, stigma, or handcuffs. Because of not seeing our stories as part of the conversation, I felt like I had to change something particularly in the reproductive rights movement, because our stories were just left out of the conversation altogether. When I had my abortion, I would see people talking about abortion on television, and it was usually some anti-abortion, like, white Christian dude and an older white woman who was talking about abortion access. And none of them spoke to me as a biracial black woman who had just had an abortion. Because the conversation was so centered in whiteness and focusing on rights and who's in charge and not actually looking at what are the lives that people are living. What do we actually need to have safe and healthy and thriving communities and pregnancies? So I created We Testify. It's an organization dedicated to the leadership of, and representation of people who have abortions. And we're working to increase the spectrum of abortion storytellers in the public sphere and shifting the way the media understands the context and complexity of abortion care. We invest in abortion storytellers to elevate their voices and expertise, particularly folks of color from rural and conservative communities, those who are queer and trans identified, and I wanna be clear, trans people deserve a space in the abortion rights movement. And those with varying abilities and citizenship statuses because immigrants and folks with disabilities have abortions too. And those who needed support when navigating the numerous barriers that are thrown in our way when we're trying to access abortion care. These are the people that I work with. You might not be used to seeing the faces of people who have abortions because articles often do that weird prego belly thing where they cut our heads off or they focus so much on the fetus that they forget that there's a whole person who needs that abortion as well.
We've been invisibilized in our own movement. Think about it. How many cases have been brought on behalf of abortion access, brought by people who need abortions? Right. My fight is to make sure that people who have abortions are actually at the center of our movement, that our voices are the ones that you listen to, not a talking head of someone who's never actually had to make that decision. And it should be matching the actual demographics of who has abortions, both the actual percentage of how people feel about their abortions, those stats I said earlier, but also making sure that people of color are front and center in this conversation. Our, our stories deserve to be heard. And I wanna be clear, all of our stories, abortions in the first, second, and third trimester, Fun fact, trimesters were made up by the Supreme Court, too. Everything you know about abortion is pretty much just made up. It's been around for thousands of years. It is part of our lives. What is at stake right now? The intersection of anti-abortion activism and anti-blackness is two circles. The same people that are funding police to shoot children in the street are also the same police or same people that are trying to shut down abortion clinics. My question for everything is about the right to black life that black and brown people get to decide our futures on our own without government coercion and state sanctioned violence. That is the reproductive justice framework, the ability to decide if, when, and how to grow your families free from violence and coercion, both ensuring that people have access to abortion, but also that we're not cutting Medicaid, that we're not cutting SNAP benefits, that we're not kicking people out on the street, and that we're not gutting everyone's access to education. We are facing dangerous and unsafe pregnancies. We are facing the loss of our freedoms and criminalization. And I wanna be clear, the only thing on the other side of making abortion illegal is criminalizing the very people who have them and who provide them. And that's not a thing of the future, that's actually what's been happening over the last 10 years, really honestly more, because the criminalization of pregnancy outcomes is something as old as black people in this country. Abortion will always be necessary. I included this because I wanna be really clear. The anti-abortion movement has a vested interest in having you think that when I got pregnant, my decision was if I didn't want a parent between placing for adoption or abortion. That's not true. When you're pregnant, you have two options. You either continue the pregnancy or you don't. If you don't continue the pregnancy, you have an abortion. If you continue the pregnancy, you either parent or you choose adoption. Those are what the pathways are. And it is very important that we are clear in understanding what people's decisions are. And we can do that through stories. We hear what people's thinking is, and that is why abortion stories are so critical to the conversation. We need reproductive justice now. When you listen to abortion stories, you understand everything that people are dealing with in this moment when they are choosing abortion or if they're trying to continue a pregnancy, but we simply don't give them the resources to be a parent in this country. As I mentioned, the, reprodu the reproductive justice framework is the right to have a child, the right to not have a child, and the right to parent the children we have in safe communities free from state-sanctioned violence and coercion. I wanna be clear, the anti-abortion movement often talks about you know, thinking of the lost lives to abortion. I want you to think about all of the people in this room, including myself, who are here because of abortion, not just my own when I was 19, but also the one that gave me life. When my mother was in an unsafe relationship, 
she decided that she did not want to continue the pregnancy, and so she had an abortion. When she was able to freely decide if, when, and how to have a family, she met my father, and she had me, and my brother, and my youngest brother, who was adopted. That is what abortion offers people, the ability to decide if, when, and how to grow their families. In this moment, we need empathy, we need to be trusted, and we need to be heard. We need abortion liberation, and we, the, we need the end of criminalization of abortion. We need to change the conversation to center people who have abortions. So get educated, spread true information, if you need help and you need to self-manage your abortion, this is information, feel free to take a picture of it. Do not talk to the cops because they are not on the side of liberation or black people. Stop snitching. Decriminalize abortion, liberate abortion. Show up for your community and show up for your loved ones. And of course, share your stories if you feel comfortable and listen to ours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Renee. Next, I'd like to offer the podium or here to you, Catherine. I'll okay. <laughs> My name is Catherine Davis, and I am the president of the Restoration Project, which is a pro-life, pro-family, pro-education organization. It was 1987. It was a Tuesday and I was going to Bible study because instead of going to lunch and eating food, we went to church and ate the word. And I go bouncing into the Bible study. I'm all happy, I'm gonna eat the word. And I walked across the threshold and the pastors announced that the topic that day was abortion. And I was like a deer in the headlights. I froze. Because you see, I'd had two abortions, but I was like Scarlett O'Hara. I'll think about it tomorrow. And that Tuesday was the day that I needed to think about it. So did I run? Did I stay? What should I do? And all I could do was stand there and cry. And the pastors looked at me and they knew I was having an internal struggle. So one got on one side of me, the other got on the other side of me, and they began to pray. And it was like a comedy show. I kept trying to get up to leave, okay, thank you, and they kept pushing me back down. <laughs> it was like, okay, thank you, and they pushed me down. And at the end of their prayer, one of the pastors handed me a book. It was called Grand Delusions, The Legacy of Planned Parenthood. And he told me, read this, and go do something about it. And that was the beginning of my journey to end abortion in America. When I read that book and realized that black women in particular were being targeted by the largest abortion provider in the nation, I thought it was gonna be a piece of cake. I thought all I had to do was go tell black women, hey, we are being targeted and that abortion was gonna end because we were being targeted. And I didn't know the battle that I was in for or how long the journey would be. So 36 years later, on June 24th, 2022, I rejoiced, but not because I had made that significant of a difference, because along the 36 year journey, I met women from across the country that I had no words for. I had no words. I had no words of justice for the wife who didn't want an abortion. She wanted to keep her child, but when she went into the abortion center and told the counselor, I want to keep my child, the counselor went out, got her husband, brought him in, and told her, you need to take her for coffee because you two are not in agreement. 
Her husband took her, put her in the car, went to a car wash, started cleaning out the car, and looked at her and said, you know, when we get home, I'm going to kill you. She went back and aborted her child because she believed that he was going to kill her. I had no words for the 60-plus-year-old woman who fell into my arms in tears because her abortion decision was the only child she would ever conceive. And now she was 60-plus with no grandchildren, no children, no one to look at her, and she was broken because she regretted her abortion decision. I had no words for her. I had no words of comfort for the 15-year-old whose mother and aunt took her to New Mexico to abort her 26-week-old son. She wanted a son, but her aunt and her mother felt like they had had abortion, so she should have an abortion, and she had to endure a three-day procedure to take the life of her child. What words of comfort could I offer her? I had no words. I had no words for the mother whose daughter got an abortion in Battle Creek, Michigan. And her daughter came over her house and told her, Mom, I don't feel good. Can I stay the night with you? And Mom said, sure. Mom realized there was something going on that she wasn't aware of, so she told her, come on, I'm going to take you to the emergency room. She took her daughter to the emergency room, and they verified that Planned Parenthood had botched the abortion and left parts of the baby in her. But rather than complete the abortion, they told her, go back to Planned Parenthood on Monday. The problem with that, was that it was the 4th of July weekend, and Planned Parenthood wasn't going to be open on Monday. But that Sunday night, mom put her daughter in mom's bed and told her, go downstairs, get some rest, you know, stay here, I'll watch over you. When mom went back a couple of hours later to check on her daughter, her daughter was dead in mom's bed. I have no words um, of peace for that mother, no words of comfort for that mother, no words of hope for that 60-plus-year-old woman. I have no words of consolation to soothe the mother who was having quadruplets, and she wanted her sons. But her partner didn't. He was much older than her, and he didn't want children. And he took her back to the abortion center, and they gave her an abortifacient. And the next day, as she went back to the abortion center, her sons dropped out of her at her feet. What words can I give to that woman? I have no words of peace, no words of warning for the 10-year-old child who was taken to Indiana to abort her child because Ohio didn't ha- had a heartbeat bill that would not allow her to get an abortion in Ohio because she was beyond the six-week limit. And I couldn't warn her that there are consequences to the abortion decision when you abort your first child. There are over 100 studies that have been done around the world that document a link between abortion and breast cancer. I couldn't tell that 10-year-old child that she's facing the trauma of rape, that she might have to face uh, breast cancer when she later on in her life. I can't tell her that. So what do we tell women that the consequences that come when we make that abortion decision? We can't change the women who have committed suicide because of their abortion decision. I have a dear friend, and his cousin had an, made an abortion decision 
and every year she would disappear at the same time each year. And the family kept wondering, where is she going? What is going on? So he finally tracked her down to see, where are you going every year at the same time and disappearing? And he, he, she told him that she had had an abortion and she was going away to grieve the loss of her child. She became anorexic and she wouldn't eat and she would purge and she would eat and she would purge and eventually that's how she died. She took her life through anorexia. So what do we do? What do we tell women? How do we help women? Why aren't we giving women choices? real choices, to understand the decision that they're making, that it's not this benign procedure and that, that um, is not going to bring harm or consequence to your life. It does. As a woman who had two abortions, I can tell you firsthand that there are consequences, there are thoughts, there is great depression that women face as a result of their abortion decision. And my colleague is right. We can't openly talk about it because we've placed abortion in this category that on the one hand, it's untouchable, and on the other hand, it's condemning. But the truth lies in the middle. And we need to inform women of the full consequences of their abortion decision and give them true options now, there's something called the time of life. If you go in the Bible and you read in Genesis, the angel told Abraham and Sarah, I'm coming back at the time of life. And I wanted to know, what is the time of life? Well, there's a very narrow window of time that a woman could even get pregnant. Very narrow woman, uh, window of time. And we should let women know that you don't ever have to get pregnant, really, with the exception of rape. Now, I don't want to minimize rape because you don't consent to be raped. But normally, if you don't have sexual relations during your fertile period, you won't get pregnant because there's a very narrow window and you can know your body well enough to know exactly when you're fertile and when you're not. They've got apps that you can download to your phone or, or track your, your cycle. They do it every day with in vitro fertilization. So we can know in advance when we are fertile and just don't have sex. Then you don't have to kill the child. So my organization and the people that I work with um, educate about abortion's detrimental impact that we are taking the life of another human being. We had, um, most of us think that when slavery began in America that all the slaves that left Africa came to America. But that's not true. Only 388,000 slaves landed in America. By the end of slavery, we were four million strong because we are a very fertile people. There has to be a better answer to the question of, of bearing children than automatically taking the life of that child. Thank you for allowing me to speak to you. Thank you, Catherine. Next is Getty Israel, and I'll make some opening comments after Getty speaks and then have a Q&A with our panelists. Getty. Good evening from Jackson, Mississippi, state capital of Mississippi. My apologies for not being there with you tonight, but I am, I am honored to be a participant in this event. I'll try not to take up much of your time. In 2012, I had the opportunity to debate a noted physician regarding the infamous personhood amendment that if it passed, would have effectively ended abortion rights in the state of Mississippi. That noted physician was Dr. Frida Bush. She was a certified nurse, myth, nurse midwife, an OBGYN, and she was also an ally. We had worked together to improve birth outcomes in Mississippi. So she was very shocked and dismayed when I sat across from her to challenge her on public TV about protecting abortion rights. She believed 
it was not reproductive justice for a woman to end her child's life, but an injustice both to her and her baby, her family, and to the community. But I countered by saying, it is an even greater injustice for the state of Mississippi, with all its resources, to continue to ignore the underlying complex social and economic factors that influence a woman's decision to have an abortion, and that also place her and her newborn at risk for experiencing preventable adverse birth outcomes and living a life of poverty. For me, it is reproductive injustice for any woman not to have health insurance before she becomes pregnant, that she does not have access to the most effective form of contraception. contraception. Mississippi has a 5% usage rate of the most effective form of contraception. That that woman is at risk of experiencing inadequate health care before, during, and after birth. That so many women like her will experience fetal deaths, premature births, the indicated inductions, subsequent cesarean deliveries, whether they are scheduled or needed by emergency, that generate hundreds of millions of dollars for a broken, failed healthcare system that is driven by expediency and profits. It is reproductive injustice that neither federal nor state government requires employers to pay her a livable wage or to provide her with maternity leave, paid maternity leave which will then force her to place her child in a substandard, unaffordable daycare before the child turns six months old, which is the minimum age the federal government encourages her to breastfeed her infant. And then it wonders why so many women in her category won't breastfeed their infants. That mother and her baby are equally at risk of dying before the baby's first birthday. For that mother to rear her baby in a poor community where environmental pollution is commonplace and every swinging dick carries a gun. It is an act of injustice that forces her to send her child to an inferior and underfunded public school system, that she is denied reasonable, modest pregnancy accommodations at her place of employment, that she will be marginalized, ostracized, oppressed, because of her race and or her class. It is to me an injustice that society still expects her and her baby to become productive citizens in the world's richest democracy led by a federal government that invests more of our tax dollars in the military industrial complex to maintain world domination and in the prison industry to sustain control over black and brown bodies. It is an injustice that she resides in a state that loves to claim that it is pro-life, but is home to the highest rates of gestational obesity, gestational, gestational hypertension, fetal deaths, premature births, cesarean deliveries, low birth weight babies, infant mortality, the fourth highest mater maternal mortality rate in the nation, and the highest rates of child poverty and extreme child poverty of children who are six and under in the nation each year. And yet this Republican controlled state have refused to improve birth outcomes and made any attempts to improve quality of life among this most vulnerable population. Republicans, Republicans, Republicans. I have called on Republicans many times about this problem. I have called out Republicans many times, and yet Republicans brilliantly expanded the abortion fight from the streets to the office suites. Over the past decades, anti-abortion activists, private organizations, and political action committees have collaborated to build a successful network of over 2,500 pregnancy crisis centers across the nation. And you can guess who they targeted, urban areas, poor, black, and underserved. Well, who are these people? They are the major voting bloc within the Democratic Party. 
After overturning Roe, the Mississippi Republican Party plans to continue with its social agenda. I want to emphasize social agenda by increasing foster care, adoptions, funding for pregnancy crisis centers. Last year, our governor signed a bill that provides up to $3 million in tax credits to private organizations and individuals who donate funds to private crisis centers. And similar bills have been enacted in other Republican-controlled states in this country. Now, what have Democrats been doing in the meanwhile? For decades, the Democratic Party assumed that Roe was untouchable. Republicans would never go that far. They have watched as state after state after state of Republicans of a Republican-controlled government have strategically streamrolled into our communities and the courts. Democrats offered no counteroffensive. And although the National Democratic Party has passed sweeping maternal child health legislation under the Biden administration, the Democratic Party as a whole has been absent on reproductive health, except for extending Medicaid benefits postpartum across the country. Let me be very clear. I am pro-choice, but I am also pro-life in the real sense. And I think I just articulated what the real sense really means. And I often challenge people who call themselves pro-life about these underlying risk factors that threaten life, that interrupts life, that shortens life, that cuts off the quality of life. But I still think it's time that us, people who call themselves liberals, I think it's time for us to step up. I think it's time for us to lead, for us to work toward more than simply abortion rights. Because merely giving poor women access to abortion, it won't eradicate unplanned pregnancies, it won't stop birth disparities among Black women, and it won't eradicate poverty among these groups. And Mrs. in Mississippi and the nation, single Black women had over 60% of their households compared with 24% of single pregnant white women. And even though the rise of single female-headed white host households are on, are, it's on the rise, I'm sorry, over 60% of our households are in poverty and headed by, headed by black mothers. Only 7% of pregnant black residents in Mississippi have a college degree compared to only 12% of white pregnant residents. I think we need a comprehensive approach. And that's what I've been fighting and pushing for, a comprehensive approach to reproductive health, what some people call reproductive justice, aimed at reducing rates of unplanned pregnancies, birth disparities, and poverty. I think it must be inclusive of access to effective, affordable contraception, childbirth education, access to midwifery care, and birth support and jobs that pay livable incomes to reduce poverty rates among young women who are at risk of having an abortion, who are at risk of having a premature baby or experiencing maternal mortality or infant mortality. So what are we prepared to do? What are we prepared to do about these horrible numbers that the press continue to report on and yet no one has put forth a strategic, strategic plan? I am proposing that we borrow a page from the Republican playbook. I think we must coordinate, organize, and strategize with Democratic lawmakers across the country, corporate donors and liberal-leaning think tanks and institutions and advocates to, a, to develop a national comprehensive and social agenda. If they have a social agenda, why don't we have one? Where is our social agenda to address these complex reproductive health issues? Why can't we address abortion along with premature babies and babies dying and mothers dying? I propose that we build women owned and operated community health centers across the nation. They have 2,500 pregnancy crisis centers. And the purpose of those crisis centers is one thing, to convince a pregnant woman not to have an abortion, during which time they have beat her over the head with scripture to make her feel guilty about even seeking an abortion. 
And what I have learned is many of those women go to those centers for resources. So why doesn't the Democratic Party offer an alternative to these pregnancy resource centers or crisis centers? These centers that we create would integrate healthcare and public health to provide effective contraception, affordable, high quality reproductive health care, maternal and child health education, social services, and job training and placement. I believe that we should be about the business of building at least two women owned and operated freestanding birth centers in every state so that many more women have access to midwifery care and birth workers. And we should staff these centers with midwives and nurse practitioners and community health workers who will work as a team to address underlying medical and social risk factors. If there is one thing that I've learned from conservative activists, it is their ability to politically organize around their social agenda and to reshape reproductive health in this country. They have worked in lockstep with Republican legislatures across this country, dictating and helping to write legislation to achieve their goals and impact our lives. And Republican legis legislatures who have failed to respond to this demand, to this social agenda, have been booted out of office. They have been relentless. They've been bold, unwavering, and unapologetic in their determination to accomplish their social agenda. Where is ours? We must do more than protect. I'm sorry, we must do more than protest in the streets. We must build a national infrastructure to achieve our social agenda. And we must redefine what that social agenda is. And we need to stop relying solely on the federal government and Planned Parenthood. Let's, let's give American women a vision they can be a part of, to fight for, that they can vote for, besides merely abortion rights. Women are hungry for better reproductive health care in general. They have had enough of this healthcare system that offers them substandard, substandard medicalized care. And they are looking for a holistic approach to reproductive health care in general. Now, this is my call to action. And this is why I am here tonight. And I said I wouldn't participate in this if there weren't a call to action. It is not enough to tell stories. I can tell stories all day. Yes, I've had an abortion. Why wasn't there someone there for me to say, hey, there's something you would like to do differently? Is there a support system? There was no support system. There was simply an abortion. I didn't want to have an abortion. I needed support. A woman calls my clinic and she thinks about having an abortion. The first thing I want to do is figure out, can I give her the support she needs? Does she really want to have an abortion? Or is she feeling forced into it because she doesn't have the support? At the end of the day, it's her decision. And I respect her decision. And I'm not going to use scripture. I mean, hell, I'm an atheist. I'm not going to use scripture to try to talk anybody out of doing anything. But if there's something I can do to help her to maintain her pregnancy and to have a healthy pregnancy and to help her get into community college and to help her to get a career in healthcare, that's what I am doing. What I'm trying to say is this has to be comprehensive, people. We can't just focus on abortion. We have to make abortion a part of the whole scheme of things. This has to be a comprehensive approach, has to be diverse, because we are addressing complex, rep rep complex re reproductive health issues. I believe and I know that liberals, among liberals, we have so much talent, leadership, knowledge, and resources. What we need is a plan. We need our own social agenda, and we need the sheer will to put it in force. And that is what I am looking for. I've been doing this work for five years, and I've done it single-handedly. And I have no support in the state of Mississippi and very little support out. But I've managed to build that community health clinic I just talked about. And if I can build a community health clinic, imagine what we can do if we work together, women, and men, if they're interested, across this country. So I'm saying once again, let's come together and let's build our own self social agenda. And let's make it inclusive of all of these factors that I've just mentioned.
I thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Getty. And I'd like to now engage the panelists in a Q&A. Now, before I begin with that, there's just a, a little bit more to fill in, in in the gaps that bring us here. In 2016, in the case Whole Women's Health v. Hellerstedt, a case that ultimately affirmed the um, precedent in Roe and also in Casey, Justice Breyer wrote, pulling up from the record from the district court, that in the United States, a woman is 14 times more likely to die by carrying a pregnancy to term than by having an abortion. For black women, nationally, they are three and a half times more likely than their white counterparts to die due to maternal mortality. The United States ranks 55th in the world in terms of maternal mortality behind Saudi Arabia and even countries where there have been genocides recently. This helps to fill in some of the narrative. Where Getty is, there is no longer an abortion clinic. There was one for a number of years that was operated and owned by Diane Durzis. She's also the person that owned a clinic in Birmingham, Alabama that was blown up by the same person who set bombs at the Atlanta Olympics, killing the security officer there, who was not a person who was pro-abortion, but did believe that women should have the authority to make decisions about their own reproductive health care. He died. One of her nurses has suffered through over 40 surgeries because of the bomb and its impact on her eyes. It would not do well our narrative and storytelling and also the facts that Getty inspires us to talk about if I didn't level set with one more fact, and there's far more that can be filled in for clarification, but about the violence that has been associated with individuals being able to receive health care and make decisions about the health care that they would wish to receive. And I share this because it's something that often doesn't necessarily make the news, and that is that over the last 50 years, since Roe v. Wade, there's been the bombing of nearly 50 clinics in the United States that provide abortion services. Those clinics also provide some of what Getty was talking about in terms of contraceptive health care, breast cancer screenings, et cetera. The reason also why I express this is because there are people who live in fear. And even tonight, to be able to hold this conversation, there is a plan in action in case there was some violence here tonight. One could only wish that we could come together and have conversations without that kind of fear, the kind of fear that one of my colleagues has who refuses to have her image posted when she comes to an event like this because she has two children. And she worries that someone might come to her home, place a bomb, or kill her children. Now some might say that is overstated, but from her perspective, given the bombing of clinics, mm -hmm. given the doctors that have been murdered, given the nurses that have suffered, for her this is about protecting her children while she provides services for even the people who protest at the clinic outside of where she does her work. With that said, I want to open up our Q&A. And Getty, I would like to turn to you because you have charged the conversation with having a plan, wanting to do more than simply storytell. Although what I have thought about from what I've heard is that you've told a very powerful story yourself in terms of being on the stage and actually challenging someone that you've worked with. Many people see these times as ones where it is very difficult to bring people together to create solutions. And so I am wondering about what you see then as a way to go forward, even locally in a state like Mississippi. And it is worth noting that the case in Dobbs 
was brought about from a challenge to the Mississippi law, which hadn't gone into effect, but was an abortion okay. ban in Mississippi, uh, banning abortion after 15 weeks of pregnancy with no exceptions for rape and incest. So what should be the action, even if we were thinking about it locally, what's the right path in Mississippi? I can't speak about Mississippi because we have a Republican controlled uh, government executive branch, as well as the legislative branch, judiciary branch. It's all controlled by Republicans. And I have reached out to Republicans to present you know, my ideas, evidence-based ideas about what we should be doing to address underlying risk factors from a public health perspective. And they have not been interested that, that I've gotten nowhere. Um, the, their, their agenda is solely on, well, their social agenda, shutting down abortion and um, placing those children in adoption, adoptions, uh, foster care. They're not interested in my, um, in my ideas. That's why I think we need, this needs to be a national plan. And I think that your institution is in the best place to host that, uh, that meeting, that first meeting, that initial meeting that brings, think, uh, that brings uh, academics and community health leaders and activists and politicians and, uh, and, and donors to the table to create a plan. How do we move forward from here? Well, you know, when you say that, it makes me think because there's been such a polarized conversation about it's Republicans, it's Democrats, and that's why I mentioned five mm -hmm. of the seven justices in row were Republican appointed. Prescott Bush, mm -hmm. the father of George H.W. Bush, was the treasurer of Planned Parenthood. And so the early roots of all of this certainly wasn't Republican uh, at all. They were very much in support of abortion rights. And so I wonder then what exactly has changed, why the landscape looks different now. But I want to connect that with something and bring you in also, Catherine and Renee. Um, and that is part of what we see in the narrative of Dobbs is one that it is a narrative about saving the lives of black women and black families. And there is a tension here because Getty has just mentioned there is a lot of suffering happening in Mississippi amongst black women. A black woman is 118 times more likely to die in Mississippi by carrying a pregnancy to term than by having an abortion. The Mississippi Department of Health even says 80% of the cardiac deaths during pregnancy are black women. So how do we reconcile, and I'll perhaps start with you, Renee, how do we reconcile, on one hand, the narrative that abortion is really like suppression of the black community? It is something that is written in Dobbs. It's in a footnote. It's something that Justice Thomas has been saying, I would say inaccurately. But anyway, it is something that is said. And part of what's pointed to is so many black women have abortions that it is abortion itself is something that just simply targets them. How do you reconcile the narrative there, these polls that are pulling? Yeah, can everyone hear me? <clears throat> awesome. Um, yeah, Getty, your words have just been sitting with me for so much, right? Because, you know, people are like, well, the majority, the majority of people who have abortions are people of color, and um, of folks who have abortions, black women do have a higher share of abortions. So then it's like, well, how can abortion bans be racist? Or, you know, all that kind of stuff. Well, part of it is because people are unable to get the the uh, contraception contraception care that they need because people are unable to have health insurance, unable to afford health care, right? They're unable to be able to decide if, when, and how to become pregnant. To your question about how is all of these abortion bans, like white supremacy and like the history of racism, right? We can actually go back to when the first abortion bans happened, right? Abortion, as I said, has been around for thousands of years. It is not a new thing. But when we actually look at when some of the first abortion bans were enacted. It was in the mid 1800s and the 1860s. Well, I don't know if anyone remembers what was happening at that point, but some people were getting free. 
and their fertility, enslaved black people, their fertility was no longer for profit and it could not be capitalized, so then it needed to be something to be controlled because there's a racist belief that black and brown people are somehow more fertile than other people or also that black women can't feel pain or uh, in the way that white women can, right? That's why there's been so many scientific experimentation without consent on black and brown bodies for his throughout history, right? So the American Medical Association both um, teamed up with a lot of politicians at the time who wanted to be able to control black people and they passed a lot of abortion bans for a couple of reasons to control black population but actually not the black population. They won, they did not want black people having children, but it wasn't, that's not what the abortions were for. It was actually to control white women, to keep white women from being able to have abortions that they were having so that they could continue to grow the white population. On top of that, doctors wanted to be able to take all of labor and delivery and, and gynecology under their wing. At that point, it had been under midwives. Who were midwives at the time? Formerly enslaved black folks, indigenous folks who were having their land stolen from them, and also immigrants at the time who were coming over from overseas and they were not going into the hospitals. So they knew they could actually control who's birthing, who gets access to care, if they could control who is the ones that are giving the care. So there was a huge smear campaign against the midwives to say that they're doing abortions, they're quacks, don't go to them. And they criminalized them through the first sets of abortion bans. That continued all the way into when abortion was legalized. It became a political issue, as you said. Nice. The, yeah. um, the Bush family was very supportive of it for many years. Um, it was actually a kind of cross-politician issue, right? But what conservatives needed was a new issue to be able to organize around once they lost school segregation. And so they needed another issue and they specifically chose abortion because they could actually then demonize black and brown people for having abortions while seeming like they care about life, even though they only care about white life, while also then putting out tropes of the welfare queen and all of the rise of the racist tropes of black and brown parents in the 80s. So I want to turn to, to you, Catherine, because you've heard now from Getty deep on the ground in Mississippi the kinds of concerns that um, are on her mind and with those that work with her in her organization beyond abortion, abortion inclusive, uh, but not, um, but not only abortion. You've also heard from Renee as well. How do you reconcile the story that is told that um, abortion is something that is connected to the suppression of Black Americans? Is that a story that that you buy into? That you think, well, that is accurate. It absolutely is accurate. I am astounded sitting here tonight and listening to my colleagues that we treat our children in the womb as if they're a disease to be gotten rid of. That astounds me. I cannot reconcile that the answer to our social justice concerns is to take the life of, of the children in our womb. We don't have a lack of access to reproductive health care in America. Why? Because Planned Parenthood, the largest abortion provider in the nation, put about 80% of their facilities in black and brown neighborhoods. They deliberately placed them there because, as they admitted, in 2020, they are a white supremacist, systemically racist organization that has caused reproductive harm to women of color. It was a New York Times article, look it up. So we know where the racism is. This is not a political 
issue. We can argue Republican, Democrat politics all we want to, but the reality is that black women, the black community, is no longer having enough children to reproduce itself. When my generation finishes dying off, I'm a baby boomer. When we finish dying, you guys are going to look around and say, what just happened? Because we are no longer having enough babies, and we are, are allowing the culture to define our children in the womb as if they are an object to be gotten rid of, rather than a blessing to be cherished and, and provided for. So, and yes, we have issues. We have issues with poverty. We have issues with health care. We ha but we need to look beyond this, this issue of, is it OK just to summarily kill the children well, for, rather than finding an adequate yeah. solution to the May issue? May I just you know, say, though, um, I, I want to follow up. Yeah. Oh, just, just one moment. But, but, but I do want to follow up with the question about who gets to decide. Right. right. Are, are those external questions coming in, or, or is it if black women decide, I want to terminate this pregnancy, should they have the right to be able to do so? But I think before that, it's worth level setting again, and I think we'll probably do it a lot at this meeting, which we probably should do, the clarification points. Because even though the Supreme Court has said that abortion is related to black genocide uh, and eugenics, so for point of clarification. Um, 1927, the case Buck v. Bell, that actually addresses eugenics at the United States Supreme Court, quite explicitly in the case, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes says that this is a case about a young white girl from the state of Mississippi. It does not involve any black people at all. The case before that, 30 years before in Skinner v. Oklahoma, did not involve a black man as related to coercive sterilization. But I think that that's just important for level setting, just what do these cases actually say? Um, and then, Renee, you wanted to be re to respond, but I would say only quickly, because yeah, just one then I want to, to ask a question about, get back to what Getty said. Yeah. Uh, and part of what you're saying, Catherine, too, which is, well, what is next? What is necessary? Who gets to decide? I mean, I think one important matter that's been surfaced is a lot about suffering that is occurring in terms of low-income communities, and I think that that is really urgent to address. So, Yeah, just to the, the point about that um, abortion clinics are specifically put in minority communities, it's actually um, less than one in 10 abortion clinics um, is actually in a majority minority community. And the way that that data point uh, was come up with originally um, was because they looked at places like Vermont, which I'm sure as you all know is known for their huge population of people of color. Um, and if there's a certain number of people of color, then that's the way it was counted. But when you actually look at where black and brown people live, it's one in 10 are abortion clinics are actually in communities of color that are majority people of color. Well, I suppose it's also a piece that's picked up a little bit in Whole Woman's Healthy Hellerstead mm -hmm. as the Supreme Court talks about how far individuals would have to travel mm -hmm. if they actually wanted to be able to terminate a pregnancy, including hours and hours. But this gets back to something that Getty has talked about and Catherine and also you, Renee, which I'm wondering, so what is necessary? What will it take in order to provide the kind of justice part of reproductive justice that's being talked about. I mean, what does that look like? Getty has said that it's not necessarily local. It needs a national solution. There's, um, you know, when Getty was talking about, like, you know, what do these centers look like? And I want to commend you, Getty, for your work. Um, I was thinking about, um, I don't know if folks know about All Options, which All Options is a pregnancy resource center in Bloomington, Indiana. And they have free diapers. They have free clothes for folks. They have formula. They also have an abortion fund because they understand that people need different resources at different points in their lives depending on the decisions that they're making and they do all options counseling and I want to see that all across this country because at the end of the day, the question is not about what 
you would decide for yourself. It's about making sure that people have the freedom to be able to make the best decision for themselves, right? And yes, there are going to be people who feel like they might have to have an abortion because the state has a family cap policy that won't give them additional funds to be able to care for another child, right? That is wrong. I stand against those and I actually really want to push the Democratic Party or really any politicians to be able to actually end policies like that, right? I want all sorts of pregnancy justice for workers, for everyone, right? But it seems that we can't come together and make sure that people have access to that care. And so I, that is why I believe so deeply in reproductive justice, because it is about the right to not have a child, but also the right to have a child, no matter how much money is in your bank account, no matter where you live, and not suppressing the reproduction of low-income folks and black and brown people, and forcing them to make constrained decisions about the size of their family because of how much money they do or do not have. So then that actually brings me, I'm going to come to you, Getty, but, but before I do, I, I, I want to then circle back, Catherine, with the question then about, well, what is the answer? What does it look like? And within the context of that, um, is it acceptable, in your view, for a person to choose to terminate a pregnancy? I mean, if the, is the dividing line that coercion, external coercion, is the problem? External coercion is a, a large part of the problem because about 64% of the abortions that are gotten in the United States are because of coercion from a parent, a, a pastor, a partner, et cetera. Um, but the answer has to be, it can't be this lopsided equation. I kind of feel outnumbered <laughs> up here. Um, um, in, in providing answers because it can't be this lopsided political discussion. Let us have a real discussion where we are putting real choice before women. What does that if look like? That looks like telling women what the consequences of their decisions are going to be and giving them mm -hmm. real choices to make on whether or not to parent, and have a family. Like I said, a woman never has to get pregnant if she knows her body. How come we're not talking about that? You think that's funny, Renee, but it is true How do you that know we can know because you laughed. That's no, why I said. I'm, but we can know we can know enough about our bodies to know when we are fertile and when we are not. Well, you know, can we have that discussion? I think can we have the discussion of providing yeah. true choices to women? Women are smart. We know how to make up our minds if we are given the appropriate information. We have to stop just giving one side mm -hmm. and give women an entire choice to know what they are talking about when it comes to family planning on both sides of the um, equation. Catherine, I want to thank yes, you for being here because, as you mentioned, you feel a little bit outnumbered, I and that certainly is not okay. the it, well. It's not the intent, but it is important that we level set and that we offer a little bit of clarity because you mentioned women, and, and I'm going to ask Getty if Getty would like to respond. But the reality is that there are a lot of people who don't know when they are pregnant. Girls can become pregnant. The 10-year-old girl that you referenced would have been a person who did not know that she was pregnant. Some of you may know that I wrote a story in the New York Times about becoming pregnant myself. At the age of 12, I did not know that I was pregnant. I didn't. Um, and I think there are a lot of people who get confused by that. But Getty, did you have a response or want to comment? And then Catherine, I'm happy to come back. Well, look. There's no need for her to feel lopsided. I'm, I'm not here to argue for or against abortion. I'm here pleading for partners, saying let's come to the table and let's figure out a plan. That's what I'm saying. Let's address risk factors from a public health perspective that places a woman at risk, and I yes, I said at risk for having an abortion or a premature baby, or dying within the first year of having a baby. I think all of those 
all of those are related. They are all poor birth outcomes. And so I'm looking for an agenda. As I said before, Republicans have an agenda. We spend a lot of time talking about these issues and we spend so little time planning around these issues. And I think it's going to take a national initiative, public and private effort for us to address these issues. And if you want to discuss abortion, then make abortion a part of it. But there are so many other reproductive health disparities that are taking place while we're having this conversation and no interventions in place to address it. We have offered natural family planning classes. And let me tell you why it doesn't work. Because over 80% of women, particularly black women in Mississippi, who, be who become pregnant are not married. They are not in relationships that are supportive. And you cannot plan your pregnancy based on your body temperature if you have a partner who's not supportive. So that's very idealistic, but it doesn't work. What we need is to make sure those women have the most effective form of contraception, that they have education to go along with that contraception, that they have support during the pregnancy if they're gonna keep the pregnancy. Again, that we help them to get into community college to get careers that are in demand. In Mississippi, healthcare is the second largest industry. And we have an aging uh, profession of nurses and other healthcare professionals. But most young women, particularly black women, end up in cashier positions, earning minimum wage. Stuck in a dead end job, raising a child by themselves. So what I wanna do is address both social and economic factors addressing this. Again, a comprehensive approach. So I'm not here to argue for or against abortion. Abortion has to be a part of the overall solution or strategy, but we need a plan. And I'm begging for a plan. And I know that can't happen tonight, but I would like that after this event is over, that your institution would lead the effort to bring these individuals to the table. And, and, and when I say these individuals, I mean people on the front line. Mm -hmm. I mean people like us who are actually doing this work. A lot along with think tanks and politicians who claim to care about maternal child health. We have a crisis and Mississippi continues to lead that crisis. And I'm really tired of, rep of, of reporters contacting me to talk about abortion, to talk about extending Medicaid postpartum when there's so many other issues that are driving our maternity crisis. I'm at ground zero, help me out. That's what I'm looking for out of this whole event. This time has gone by rather quickly. Uh, and there would be so much more for us to be able to talk about, uh, and that will, in fact, flow to tomorrow. And amongst those issues, they include what would be a comprehensive approach, as you've asked for, Getty. They include thinking about what really should be a social agenda that promotes the broader spectrum of reproductive justice, which is not just about abortion, but includes thinking about pregnancy and individuals being able to survive while pregnant without maternal morbidities if they survive. And what about mm -hmm. religious freedom? and the diversity of religious ideology as related to reproductive health and rights. What is the role of race and racism and socioeconomics as we think about these issues and the intersections of LGBTQ equality within the connection of these issues. What comes next in those spaces, considering that in the state of Texas, which brought us SB 8 at the beginning of last year, is a state, and that's the abortion ban after six weeks of pregnancy, which has no exceptions for rape or incest and has a bounty hunter provision, but Texas is also the state now wherein parents of trans children are deeply worried about providing the kind of health care services that their children need, lest they will be investigated by the state and their children taken away from them. How do those issues connect? And at the federal level, what will be the outcome? Will there be a Women's Health Protection Act? Or will there be a 15-week ban on abortion? 
given what this Congress looks like. And what about the role of the Equal Rights Amendment? It has not been published, but is that some pathway forward for those who would support an abortion right or would not support an abortion right? And finally, what is the role of education as we talk about this evening matters of abortion, a little bit of contraception. We've not even begun to scratch the surface on sex education in schools. It's worth noting that American children and teenagers have not only the highest rates of pregnancy amongst industrialized nations, but also the highest rate of sexually transmitted diseases as well. How does that connect with our failure to educate, or in states that have now weaponized education, such as there are certain things that you simply may not learn, or you may only learn things a certain kind of way. And finally, finally, one of the things that certainly is quite noticeable by the makeup of this panel and by the discussions that have taken place are black women as the canaries in the coal mine. What hasn't been discussed, but will be tomorrow, the criminalization, the policing, the punishment, the policing and punishments before Dobbs, right. dating back to the 1980s and 90s with black and brown women being targeted for their pregnancies, being 10 times more likely to have law enforcement or child protective services called on them if they admitted to or told their doctor that they used an illicit substance during pregnancy. That type of criminalization and policing pre-existed Dobbs and what will now happen after Dobbs is only a wonder. But I thank the panelists and I hope that you will too join me in thanking them for being here with us and sharing. And as well, our host and I'll call Jane back up to close us out. Thank you all. I, I said it was going to be hard. It's hard, right? It's good hard. Um, and uh, let me thank um, all the panelists for your work in the world, for your work here tonight, um, for your passion and your perspectives, and Michelle for an extraordinary grace as a moderator in a difficult conversation. Thank you.